Sarah and I will do these rapid fire questions. They're sort of rapid fire uh, get to know you questions and the answers are really designed to be one sentence or one word and we'll try to hold you to it. We'll be, wish us luck. <laughs> All right, Sarah. All right, so are you ready? Oh, and if you can each grab your microphone. Uh, rapid okay. fire. Okay, let's get going. What was your favorite activity while a student at the U of O, Bob? Uh, I actually was a wedding photographer, sideline. Great way to meet young women. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart? Favorite activity. I was in a fraternity, so we drank beer. Um, <laughs> and I would pick my study spots based on my surroundings, put it that way. <laughs> All right, when was the last time you were on campus and what did you do? Stuart. Uh, I have a daughter going to the University of Oregon. She's a junior, so um, she doesn't have any money because dad won't give her any money. So when I went there, um, we went to a very nice lunch, which she really appreciates. <laughs> and Bob. Uh, last time was two weeks ago. I met with Sarah Nutter, the new dean of the business school, had lunch with a scholarship recipient from the business school that our family sponsors. Um, what is your favorite activity now outside of work and family? Uh, I'm a serial designer, so it doesn't matter if it's big equipment or arts or crafts or whatever, that's what I spend most of my time doing. Stuart? So because I have nothing else to do, I decided to become the Lincoln High School tennis coach. And my daughter is on the girls team and I'm coach the boys team. And so even though we've had tons of rainouts this year, uh, we've qualified 10 out of the 12 spots for state, which is in a couple weeks. And my son did not because he's a sophomore and we've got a really good team. But my daughter qualified for the second year um, and she got second place. So state's in a couple of weeks. So I spend a lot of my time um, with rainouts or actual practices um, this spring. And it's going to end in a couple of weeks. So and then I'll actually get to play tennis after that. What did you do on your last vacation? Stuart. So I have a daughter at Oregon. And um, she actually did last fall semester at sea, which is every human being's fantasy. It's 600 kids um, on a boat traveling halfway across the world, studying in route. And first day, there's a uh, class on, on land, and then the kids get to play after that. So fortunately for me, Thanksgiving was in Peru. And so we went down for Thanksgiving. Uh, I had uh, guinea pig instead of turkey. Um, and and we climbed up uh, Machu Picchu and went to Cusco and some of the most amazing. It's, it's Peru is a phenomenal place. And then I threw, I'm not a very good parent, I threw both young children on the plane, flew them home. My wife and I went to a week together in Colombia, went to Medellin. Uh, Bogota and Cartagena. It was phenomenal. Great food, great people. And it's kind of an interesting time to be there. They just f signed the peace process, so um, it's kind of a, they're excited about the future of their country. It's, they're great people, so. We'll follow you for vacation. Bob. Uh, we have three adult sons, and all are involved in the business, so it's hard to take everybody away at the same time if you have Adult children buying for Christmas is a real pain. So I suggest to my wife that we travel with the kids instead. So we took our oldest son uh, with his wife and our granddaughter to Japan. Uh, he was a two-year jet for all you Japanese folks out there. Uh, my youngest son and his wife we took to Belize uh, last summer, which just about made me crazy uh, for lack of things that I was interested in doing. Relaxing is not on my checklist uh, and then this fall we're going to take my middle son and his steady lady friend to Greece for 10 or 12 days in Greece. Very nice. Um, can you name an influential influential person from your time as a student? Bob. Easy. 
School of Frederick and Communication, you who, School of Frederick and Communication, Dr. Dominic LaRusso. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. And what was the question? It was, name an influential person from your time at the University of Oregon. Well, I grew up in a very small town in Eastern Oregon and had never really, um, really met kind of upperly mobile kids. A lot of kids just kind of want to work at the factory and stay home. And so when I went to Oregon, one of the best things I did was join a fraternity house. And for me, it provided structure, and I got to meet other kids that had ambition. Um, I sat them down after a while, and I said, wait a second. Let me get this straight. Your parents pay for your school? How does that work? I mean, they write the check to you, and you write it to the school, or does that, they pay the school, pays for food? I was like astonished because I had to pay for my own college. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was great meeting kids that actually had ambitions of grad school, et cetera. Um, one of the particular person that really helped me a lot during college was a guy named Jeff Noodleman, who was uh, very involved with the university. He has been a great friend and a, and a great, great person to, to know that's very, that has remained involved with the university. Who do you turn to for advice and honest feedback? Stuart. Well, I'm a CEO of a company, but my wife is really the one that I kind of turn to for advice. I also have a board of directors that, um, for compliance reasons, you have to have uh, board meetings and document discussions. But in between um, board meetings, I'll, I'll um, uh, communicate with them and ask them questions about certain issues that come up. And then, of course, I've had uh, one person that's been with the founding of the company about 17 years. And uh, I really, really rely upon her advice. Her name's Tara Henderson. She's been with me from day one and a great colleague and great friend. And Bob? Uh, path was a little bit different for me because I started out by myself, did not have a mentor per se, but with three adult sons who became part of the business, I got far more advice than I ever wanted. <laughs> uh, and as far as feedback, that of course goes back to my wife. Um, how do you stay engaged with the U of O right now, broadly or narrowly defined? Bob? Uh, we started our involvement, uh, well, I personally made a donation to the U of O a couple months after graduation, I thought, and then I ran out of money, but um, we got involved with the athletic department. We set up a uh, scholarship, general scholarship for an incoming senior that has now moved to a fifth year product design student and then we just recently set up a scholarship for an incoming senior in the business school, somebody on an entrepreneurial track. Okay, thank you. And Stuart, how do you stay engaged with the U of O? Well, Kim and I go to football games all the time. Um, uh, we've kind of uh, probably tried to attend about half the football games with the family, take a family trip down there, and, and uh, I threw some money at some of the na national championship games in hopes that they would uh, – uh, win, but um, I, so a sporting event to me is a good way to socially interact with old friends I haven't seen for a long time. I'm on the U of O Portland Council, um, and then I actually spoke at the law school about three weeks ago. Uh, the professor did warn me it was an afternoon class and they would fall asleep, um, but I seemed to kind of keep them awake. Uh, they were more interested in the law, and I actually uh, was more interested in kind of giving them the lay of land and giving them practical advice on certain issues. And the last uh, rap rapid fire, you could see how rapid this was, um, question. And then we have six more in-depth questions. And then after that, we definitely want to open this up for questions from the audience. So you can definitely think about some of those right now. But the last fun question, what did you, when you were in grade school, what did you want to be when you grew up? So Stuart. Taller. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that works. We'll take that one word. Uh, Bob. <laughs> uh, it wasn't so much what I wanted to be, but at that time, I think in sixth grade, my lifetime goal was to make $2,000 a month. That would have been big bucks. Thank you. Thank you so much.
All right, so now we're going to transition to the business side, even though we touched on it, actually, through those questions. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with Bob. Could you take a moment and describe your business right now and um, ideas that you can pepper through your description are what's on your mind right now? What, what keeps you awake at night? And, um, you know, these kind of things. That would be great to share opportunities that you see or organizational <coughs> challenges. So my path was start my own business. Uh, I was essentially uh, learned what I was doing as a sales representative. Started the company with me, myself, and I, uh, winches, hoist, lifting equipment. Uh, I always say there's nobody out there that's giving career guidance, saying you ought to study this stuff because you can make a decent living with it. Uh, the easy spot to give you an idea of what we do Go up to the zoo, go into the elephant keep, look at the hoists that are in there that lift the play balls and the food. We designed and supplied those to the zoo. Uh, you can go any place on the planet just about, uh, and you'll find a winter hoist if you look for it. Our little company, as I describe it, at the end of the street in the pea patch in Beaverburg, has sold product on every continent. We have uh, sold to SpaceX, we sell to Boeing, uh, we do a lot of military type stuff, but again, it's very special, small niche with expertise that, that gets us there. Other part of the company, we do scale models of construction equipment, limited editions, and you say, what in the world is that all about? Uh, it was an opportunity, customer on a winch job said, hey, I'd like to have a scale model, long story short. We made 300 models, I sold 300 models, I thought that was into the business, people kept calling and saying, what's next, what's next? And so I said, well, if we made money on the first one, maybe we can make money on the second one. Uh, and that company is now run by my middle son. The older son has started the process of pushing me out of the equipment side of the business. The third leg of what we do is total regression on my part. Uh, I couldn't afford to be a hot rodder when I was a kid. Uh, so we now build custom instruments and custom steering wheels for hot rods. Uh, we're nationally known. We are slowly working our way into a very, very uh, established business. You say, where's the common factor? And I just say, this is all in my sandbox. This is uh, stuff that I like to do. Uh, when I was growing up, and I think Stuart and I probably had some things in common, I paid for my schooling myself. Uh, I went to school full-time, I worked 40 hours a week, and I partied double-time because I wasn't going to miss out on anything. And so to this day, that, that time consumption stays with me. I can't sit still for very long. I'll get through this. I'll be okay, James. Uh, but, but once I'm out of here, it's on to let's go do something, let's go find something, let's go create something, let's make something. And for me at this point, a lot of that is turned over to the artistic side where I get to make strange little sculptural pieces and let my wife scratch her head and say, what are you talking about? Chicken logging. And if anybody wants to know about logging chicken, you can talk to me after this. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Just a follow-up question. Um, so when you look at the next five years, for example, what are some of the opportunities that you're excited about or some of the challenges that make you a little uneasy? Well, I, I tell people I can't spell retirement, so that's not in the cards for me. Uh, what I'll see is that my role will change inside the company. Uh, Grant, my middle son, has pushed me away from the model business very slowly, very gently, uh, to the point I have to say, you just got some models in. Yeah, there are two or 3,000 models that showed up in the warehouse. They're sold, they're headed out. Uh, Eric is doing the same thing on the equipment end of the business. Uh, we just wrote the largest order in the company's history, and I had to go to him and say, what did you sell? Uh, because I was not really part of that, that process. Uh, so that transition stuff is going very, very well. Uh, the third part, uh, the hot rod stuff, I'll probably stay with that for some time. And the challenge there is to turn it from just being a whole lot of fun into being strongly profitable, so at some point, somebody will want to buy it and take it away. Thank you so much. Stuart, can you describe your business? So I run an independent trust company. And an independent trust company is a very rare entity 
um, nationwide. They're a lot more common in the Deep South, the East Coast, and the Midwest. And there's a number of reasons for that, but basically um, I run an investment company using a bank charter. So um, a trust company is regulated by the state of Oregon. So we're regula regulated by the same folks that regulate banks. We only have one regulator. We do not um, have the FDIC. We do not take accept deposits. So we don't have the FDIC regulator. For those that you may not know, um, banks either have a state charter or a federal charter. In addition to that, um, they are, all banks that have deposits also have FDIC charters. And the FDIC they have slightly different processes, but that's how banks are run. But because we don't take deposits, we have a state charter. Um, and for most of the independent trust companies, they're under a state charter. So we do um, investment management, financial planning, and trust and trust management for um, folks over a million dollars. So we have a million dollar minimum. And we, when attorneys draft trusts, we draft the trust also, by the way. I went to law school, so I remember the bar. Um, and during that process, you know, you know, in your 20s, and you're kind of trying to figure out what you want to do when you grow up, if you're going to grow up. Um, and I found that that the trust is uh, running a trust company is a perfect intersection between law, people, and finance. So um, I really get I understand. Finance, I, thought, I love the challenges of finances, taxes, investments, etc. I also understand legal issues, trust, trust, you know, contracts. Um, some of these things come up occasionally during um, my job. And, um, and then, of course, people. And I find that, that money has an amazing effect on people, both positively and negatively. There are also many ways to hold your money. There's many different types of accounts. Uh, you can either inherit money outright, you can inherit it in a trust. And so I find all that fascinating to me. Um, I also have a phenomenal staff that really does all the work. <laughs> I'm kind of the support staff, my, my st leadership style, servient leadership. So I kind of let them do their job and support their efforts. Um, and so we do just a whole number of things. We have a, a very, we're kind of selective on who we pick. So it's not everybody, we don't take everybody to walk in the door. We also don't really have an army of salespeople. And most people think of the financial world. They think of their sales rep that's kind of giving them access to uh, a big, large company. And, you know, in the trust business, it's, it's a, uh, it's complicated. You don't meet somebody and the next day hand them millions of dollars. Um, so that's kind of what I do. Great. And uh, picking up off of your comment about being selective of who you work with, um, I would like to ask you about how you make decisions. So, you know, when you run an organization, I can imagine that nonstop day, day and night you're having to make decisions. So can you talk about how you make those, those decisions? And, you know, when are those, those decisions easy and when are those decisions more difficult? So, Stuart? Well, for good or for bad, it, in the banking world, there is lots of process imposed upon you. So we have to come up with a three-year plan. We have to follow that plan. We have a very specific budgeting uh, process. We're constantly evaluating how we're doing related to the budget. Um, there's also um, a, a lots of internal processes for you know, we have Reg 9 where you have to do formal written initial reviews and annual reviews. Um, there's lots of formalities to the banking world. And so to the outside world, we're just nice people that are helping you out. But inside, there's lots of, of work that's done to formalize some of the things that we do. And getting back to the mentor issue that you talked about earlier, I, I rely upon my staff. I mean, I, I truly... Um, ask them how things are going um, and how, it's, how it is with certain clients. <clears throat> so they're the ones doing the work um, and they're the ones kind of implementing the decisions that are made by the group. I also try to foster teamwork um, by having uh, meetings, not frequent meetings, but very strategic meetings where we kind of have fun 
we have um, summer parties, we have a holiday party in January, and then we'll try to have fun events outside that. Um, what keeps me up at night, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I guess it's maybe it's because I've done it so long that um, I always think that things are never as good as you think they are and things are never as bad as you think they are. I think um, when you find a stressful situation that um, – I used to have <laughs> more insomnia when it first started out, like making payroll and things like that. But um, now it's not so not as stressful as it used to be. I just have such a good team and a good support structure, um, and so far the kids are haven't been in prison yet. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, that's my answer. Great, great. So Bob, can you tell us about how you make your decisions? Well, it's a it's wide open question. So we'll start this morning. I walk into the closet. I look at the rack and say, "Okay, I got to dress up today." So I'll put on a long sleeve shirt. Uh, so uh, I have a in many ways enviable position. Uh, the goal, which I think is probably what Stuart would admit to, too. Part of the secret is hiring people who are smarter than you are not necessarily smarter at running an organization, it's smarter at what you want them to do. So if you walk into my building and you walk around, you look at the equipment, you look at even the computers, and you say, Bob, can you run one of those? The answer is, I'd be doing well to get the thing turned on. And so decision making for me is a, a process that runs all the way from uh, what I learned when I was in the service, I was in the field artillery, we did what was called fire for effect, and that's where you, where you cut loots. Now, fire for effect means let's get it moving, let's get going. Part of my philosophy is it's better to make a decision that you have to correct than sit idle and do nothing. And so if you watch what we do, if you uh, follow me through the course of the day, it's Let's keep everything moving. Make a decision that moves us forward. Don't make a decision that stops us in our tracks because as a small company, if we're not moving, we're absolutely finished. Uh, the other analogy I use with our employees is uh, we're on that ship with your daughter, we're the crew. Uh, if something fails, we have to fix it on the run. We don't have the luxury of stopping and saying, okay, call in repairs. Uh, you're out in the middle of the deep blue. You got to keep moving. You got to keep going. How do we fix it and keep momentum going? Uh, a lot of decision making is completely out of my hands at this point. Uh, I think the thing that I first heard from my kids years ago was better to apologize than ask. And so what I get is a, is a competent crew, the same as Stuart has. One of the things that I find myself doing is please tell me what we've done so I have some idea of where we're going. Uh, so decision making to me is is not painful. Uh, I had the nights where I would wake up when I first started the equipment side of the business, look at the ceiling and go, who would buy another winch or hoist? There have been millions of these things sold. It's not rocket science, uh, but guess what? People keep buying them and they keep going out the door and we, we're still in business. Can I take a little sideline? Can I, can I go a little further? Okay, it's, it's hard for Stuart, myself, entrepreneurs. There is no mutual admiration society, okay? So we don't get recognized as being a leader in the field, et cetera. But I got a call from Jet Propulsion Laboratories. These are the guys who put the little devices up on the Mars. And I have to tell you, I am now a certified rocket scientist consultant, okay? I am not a rocket scientist. <laughs> Don't, don't confuse that with being a rocket scientist. I am not, but there's a little tiny portion of the mechanical world that they did not understand that I knew how to do, so I got hired by JPL. There you go. How about that? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. So I think my next question, I believe you've already touched on it a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate. Um, what have you learned over the course of your work that informs the way that you do business right now or you lead people over the years? From my perspective, the thing that was missing when I was in school is a really deep explanation of the fact people are people. 
Uh, we've got a sociologist in the crowd or two. Raise your hands, okay. People are people. Any psychologists out there? People are people. Salespeople, people are people. Uh, we're told you can't stereotype. Okay, I won't stereotype anybody. But I've learned that you can put people into categories. Uh, when I was in the service, my first sergeant said, Pete, there are four kinds of people. There are smart people, lazy people, aggressive people, and passive people. The combination of those two factors determine who gets out of the way because they're smart and lazy, who fouls things up because they're not so smart and aggressive, who gets in the way because they're not very smart and they clog it up, and those who are actually smart and aggressive can get out there and get things done. And I think what you see in this group is a bunch of people who are smart enough to get out there and get things done. Another little tip, and, and this is something that comes from my group management, is that part of what we assume in this group is you're with a bunch of smart people, and you are with a bunch of smart people. But remember one thing, half of, this, half of the people in this room are below the average intelligence of everybody in this room. So when you sit up in front of somebody, when you start talking to somebody, when you're in a group of employees, when you sit down with, a, with your family, whatever it may be, you have to keep in mind that not everybody can keep up with you, that you have a position that's probably ahead of where the rest of the group is. For me today, I'm way underneath that middle point. So uh, congratulations to you all. Thank you, Bob. Stuart, what have you learned over the course of the, your work and life that informs the way you do business and lead people? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, I think early in my business life, uh, there was in my work, there was a temptation to take any business just because it was business. And when you first start out uh, running a company, you, you um, are presented with opportunities. And sometimes you're um, faced with, do you want to take business just because it's business? Or do you want to be selective? Uh, because oftentimes, you know, we really don't lose clients. But clients, when they come to it, it takes a while for us to get clients, but uh, we don't really lose clients. So early on, you would probably get everybody else's problems presented to you, and you had to be kind of selective on which accounts that you wanted to work, people that you wanted to work with. Um, so that was kind of an uh, interesting thing early on. You also want to um, always act with integrity. Never, um, never take any shortcuts. Um, and I also felt like anytime you failed early on, because Bob and I talked about this earlier. In business, you're going to fail at something. You're going to make a, dis a bad decision that you wish you would have done differently. Um, not based on unpure motives, but based on just, you just, sometimes in business, you um, have to make decisions. And sometimes those decisions are better, some better decisions are better than others. So you don't want to take any shortcuts um, and abandon your integrity because I think you'll regret it. But when you do make a bad decision, um, I think it's a learning experience for you. And um, I think you can learn um, more from your bad decisions than you can from your good decisions. So I also feel like there is, in, in business, um, you try to do something every day to strategic, do something strategic every day. You do something every day to affect the bottom line, either in a positive way you know, cutting expenses or growing the revenue. And then probably the most important thing is you also try every day to touch somebody um, in a positive way. And I think that's, those three things kind of help you kind of, if you can kind of think about that every day. I also think you need to understand and be compassionate for people because everybody comes from um, a different perspective. Everybody has for lack of a better term, baggage. And so you kind of need to understand people and uh, never treat, treat them with, with respect um, and never be mean to them. Great, thank, thank you. you. So both of you have already addressed the mentoring question a little bit, so I'm gonna turn this one a little bit on its head because 
uh, there are many people in this room who might be looking for mentors, or what, even if it's not the two of you, they're looking to cultivate mentors. Um, what advice do you have for people who are seeking those relationships? Um, how, how do they best introduce themselves? And, and we know that you can't just you know, find a name out of the phone book. Who knows what a phone book is these days? Um, but you can't just randomly find one and say, be my mentor. But you know, from the perspective of someone who oftentimes is asked to be uh, someone else's mentor, what do you want them to do that would make it easier for you to, to be a guide or an, an advocate for them? Stuart. Is that for me? Sure. Oh, both of you, but sure. So my, uh, you know, like I said earlier, growing up in Hermiston, not a lot of people that had um, high ambitions of, of kind of going elsewhere. Uh, and my father was not around for probably about 10 years. Um, he was a Navy SEAL and he had some trauma from from Korean War. And so kind of he, he wasn't around for a long time. I ended up getting reacquainted with him um, starting about age 20. So that was kind of nice to have his perspective. I think I think uh, mentors are all around you if you just kind of know where to look. I think just generally in life you can find um, things um, around you if you just know where to, know what to look. And and uh, my wife and I have a very good marriage, and we married 24 years. Yeah, um, she has no idea, of course. By the way, <laughs> I'm the sensitive one. Um, but her parents had a great marriage and my parents and you know, my dad wasn't around so they had a poor marriage and we seem to have the same values in our marriage um, and we both came from completely different backgrounds and so I think that you can find mentors wherever you are. I know when my dad passed uh, 13 years ago which was a huge day in my life um, I s wanted to seek out uh, people that I knew of his generation and um, I just basically imposed myself and would call people up and and just seek advice from them and it was very very comforting and, and nice to hear the voices of uh, people from that era um, I also think that people think that uh, mentors are people uh, that have already succeeded and I think if you look around you'll find people that are in the midst of succeeding and I think it's interesting um, we've been taking um, kids in from all over the all over the world the last couple summers to our home and one of the kids that was at our house a couple of years ago was a kid from Iraq and he's a Yazidi kid um, he couldn't go home because his uh, village was taken over by ISIS <clears throat> so he's here on asylum and I've been touching base with him and um, kind of helping him out and helping him find his way and I really admire this this kid uh, and I think we have this kind of special relationship. I have no f formal role with him other than kind of helping him out, taking care of him. And uh, there's also other people in your life that um, could be your mentor um, and you can learn things from. So I don't think you necessarily have to find um, one person that's already succeeded and um, have an ongoing relationship with that person. I think it really helps. If I've done anything right in my life in my business career it's early on I realized the value of relationships and I think you need to find folks some folks that are like you but also I think you need to find folks that are not like you and I think they're out there and um, sometimes they have time and sometimes the time is not right for them but if you find a way uh, uh, if you find a person that you feel has given you strength and guidance I think you need to find them Thank you, Stuart. Bob, anything to add? No, Stuart said it all. <laughs> uh, of course, I have something to say. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so for me growing up, I really didn't have a mentor per se. I hid in books a lot. Uh, so a good part of what I do is look and read and evaluate. Uh, I typically, and I think this is standard practice for all of us, I find those who agree with my position, and I use that to support my position. I tell people I am an Eagle Scout, but I was never a choir boy. Uh, so what's really important to me, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, all those things are early values that were instilled in me. 
So part of it becomes looking for people who share those common values. Uh, if you can find people with those values, then you start moving forward. If somebody comes to you, this is, this is just sales, this is simple selling. If I go to you and say, can you help me with, guess what? Virtually everybody has been disarmed at that point. Uh, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Can you give me directions on how to find something? People will drop their guard at that moment, and if you simply ask a question, can you help me understand this? Can you help me understand that? Stuart, tell me about this million dollar limit for trust. Can you go a little lower and maybe we could work together someday? Uh, guess what? We just opened the door for a conversation, even though Stuart said it's a million dollars or hit the road. Uh, so if you go to somebody and you start talking to somebody and simply say, I've got an issue, I'm trying to figure this out. How does this work? How does this fit? The response is gonna be quick and for you it's a test of, and this is the other part of it, do I want to work with this person? Uh, what you see up here, if you sit down and talk with us, you may say, it's not my style. That's not where I want to go. So again, don't worry so much about the formal relationship as actually being able to have the courage, muster it, it's not hard to do. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? It's not very difficult. Uh, we make a fair number of cold calls looking for people who want to buy a winch or a hoist. And if you pick up the phone and say, would you like to buy a winch or a hoist? <laughs> What's the answer gonna be? And everybody said, no. But if you call somebody up and say, hi, can you tell me who in your re organization is responsible for X, Y, Z, it's a chance to get past that, that first hurdle, uh, find your way into an organization. Unless, of course, you get stuck in the telephone tree and then you're talking to somebody in India. Uh, but uh, again, mentorship to me is not, is like Stuart said, doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be an individual. Uh, books that I've read over the years, of course, back in my day, it was the Peter Principle. Uh, Peter Principle was, uh, then it became the, the Search for Excellence. One of the books that I really, really bought into uh, is The One Right Way, which was about uh, Taylor and his systematic approach to getting things done. Uh, nobody, most people don't know it, but he was also responsible for high-speed cutting tools, which changed the machining world which changed the world we live in. Uh, so all kinds of stuff out there. And again, from a mentoring standpoint, you have to make that first move. You have to ask the question, and is it if, if it is, can you help me with something? It should open the door for you. Thank you, these are really good advice. Um, what, um, what are you still trying to learn? Let's start with you, Bob. Uh, I tell people I graduated, and I'm not ashamed of it. I graduated in 74. That was the era in football where we won one game, and it was we were told it was reason for encouragement. It had to get better the next year. So I go back a long, long ways. Uh, what I'm still trying to learn, still trying to figure people out, uh, because even though I say everybody's people, people, it's still an ongoing challenge to get everything figured out, and, and how does that work? Uh, personally, the challenges for me always fall back to the design side of things. Uh, I'm having a whole bunch of fun with my sculptural stuff. I've done a lot of photography. I, I have in front of me, and it scares my wife, I said, I want to paint. And she says, paint the house. And I said, no, I don't want to paint the house. I want to <laughs> paint something. I've never painted anything since back in grade school days. So for me, most of it is personal challenges great deal of the learning curve is moving into new businesses, moving into new opportunities, and figuring out those fields. Awesome, thank you. And Stuart? Wow. Um, well, personally, I love to travel and I love to go learn about cultures. I don't need a fancy hotel or restaurant. I like to look at, learn about history, going to faraway places. I like hot and dirty, so. Um, Although Paris is nice, but um, <laughs> uh, my job's pretty complex. My job also is to kind of be the big picture guy. So 
taxes, investments, it's always changing. We got a new, I don't know if you had an election last year, new president. Um, so things, um, I kind of need to keep up with some of those changes um, and things are being implemented um, both regulatory, legally, et cetera. Um, so I'm always um, involved with kind of those changes. Um, I'm on the Oregon Bankers Trust Committee, so when the trust law changes both to the state and federal, I have to keep on top of that. I'm also the board of the Independent Trust Independent Trust Company Association, and we're going to D.C. in September. Just staying current on all these changes, and there is tons of changes coming down the pike uh, with all the things that I need to know. <clears throat> um, I think you can always get better um, at, at your job. I think that the second you feel like you're having a good day or you have something positive happen at work, something negative is right around the corner. So like I said earlier, you don't get – Nothing's ever that great or that bad, and you keep going. But it is important you have uh, good time management. I also have to get better at managing emails <laughs> and texts. You know, get a gazillion a day and how to plow through all those and respond appropriately. Uh, but technology helps, I think, a lot in that regard. Um, the kids are going to be out of the house here in a few years. There's got some other things I want to do. Um, with my new phase of life after that. So that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. So I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Before I do, I want to point out on each of the tables, there are what we call get involved forms. Um, I don't know about you, but just sitting here and hearing you know, the, the, the reflection, the experiences, the insight of Bob and, and Stuart and, and the, the wonderful question asking ability of Sarah, um, we have an amazing network. People have great insight, great experiences, but more than that, their, their eagerness and willingness to help one another um, and, and respond to those questions of, can you help me, uh, you know, whatnot. So um, all of you in this room have that capability and we would love to figure out ways that we can plug you into um, the chapter or um, other volunteer roles. And so whether it's uh, being more active or um, maybe hosting an event or being more, uh, again, one thing I noticed is so many of you are members of the Alumni Association, I can't thank you all enough. Um, who, uh, someone who joined us is Aaron Essekop, our, our Senior Director of the Alumni Association in the back. Um, and by the way, if you thought that $10, $15 was a really cheap breakfast for an event like this, you're right, but we have, we have our members to thank. It's the membership fees that allow us to keep these costs very low. So again, for all of you who are members, thank you so much. Uh, if you're not yet a member, please ask any of us staff folks or even some of your fellow alums why you choose to be a member of the Alumni Association uh, because this is what we're all about, to bring ducks together for, for fun, for professional development, all good reasons. So at this point, I'm gonna walk around, um, and maybe even Camille can help me with passing the my, uh, microphone, but questions? Oh, let me pass this to you because of course, it's being recorded. So Stuart, you, you mentioned service leadership as an integral component of how you run your business. And I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about what that exactly means and how you came to that as your leadership style or philosophy. Well, I, I, I never really heard the term until a number of years ago, but I've always felt the best ideas are not the ones that I run around telling people to do and implement. The best idea is get a, getting a collaboration. I get excited about having collaboration um, at the company. Um, and I think it's just important that, that people buy into what you're doing. And that way they own it. They came up with the, the idea. Um, and I think it's just Im important. That's just, to me, that's the most important part of leadership is getting everybody else to row the, so, the same boat, the same direction. Great, thanks. Other questions? Great. Thank you both for your time. It was very interesting um, information you shared. This question is actually for Bob. I am. Um, I never considered a family business, but I have two young ducks, uh, 13 and 16, two boys, and um, I could see having them as a part of my business someday. Bob, can you tell me about your journey 
in bringing your three boys into your business? The end point is all three are involved. The starting point was not once did I ever say anything to them about becoming part of the business. Uh, for me, it was always find your path, do what you want to do, do it well, go for it, see ya. To the point my wife and I thought that our kids would disappear and we'd never see them again at some point. That's not hardly true. Uh, Eric came back from Japan, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, did not seem really aggressive about finding work and I said something to my wife and she said, well, you know, I'd really like to work with you, but he's afraid to ask. Uh, so you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's so intimidating about me? Well, part of it was that I'd never mentioned it to him, and so he was afraid to broach the subject. Uh, Grant, the middle son, we brought him in part-time to help because he was way too independent to work with me. Uh, Grant is the kid who got me to coin the phrase, if you weren't so much like me, I wouldn't be able to stand you at all. And so uh, he and I locked horns, he and I went back and forth, he and I battled it out big time, but he's the one who came in, took over the model business, and essentially just kind of pushed me off to the side and said, I can take care of it, Dad, everything will be fine, don't worry about it, it's okay. Alex, the youngest son, is probably as passively aggressive as anybody that you'll ever meet. Uh, it doesn't matter what you say to, what I say to Alex, the comment is always, okay. Uh, Alex, you need to do this. Okay. What do you think about this? Okay. Uh, so he's, he's pretty low key. I think Alex will probably be the first one and this is creating some, some real interesting dynamics within the, the family business structure, he'll strike out on his own. Uh, up to this point, it's always been everybody contributes, everybody contributes differently, everybody takes out of a common pot. But now that Alex is talking about going his own way, how do you take care of the issues that come with the assets that have been accumulated over the years that are essentially going into trust for the kids and one of the kids says, I'm not going to work and create value there anymore. That's going to be the interesting challenge to us. So yeah, absolutely, if your kids are interested, uh, I, I tell people it's just like marriage. It's either the best in the world or it's the worst in the world. Oh, well, actually, the... Thanks for being here also. I wanted to know how you guys know if you're going through a challenging time, whether to pivot or stay the course, and if you have an example. You first, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the comments that I make to people is that I am so busy I don't get a chance to turn around twice in the same spot. And so not to avoid your question, but I would say, yeah, I would probably plant one foot, pivot, turn it in a circle and say, hey, I'm still moving forward. Uh, those decisions, and I don't think there's any easy way to put it into a capsule and say, here's the magic pill. I think every one of those decisions when you're facing really, really hard decisions to make, uh, I was faced one time with shutting the company down. Uh, no sales, nothing in the future, prospects were bleak. It was ugly, ugly, ugly. Uh, so I called the crew in, three, three of the people I worked close with at that time, and said we're gonna go through an orderly shutdown. We will not shut down and leave people hanging. We will not shut down in chaos. We will close down orderly. We'll be finished with it. We'll walk away with a clean slate. Uh, um, Next day, the phone rang. Uh, lady says, we need uh, 14 custom hoists delivered in Detroit by the end of whatever the period of time was, and we're back in business. We're off and running again. So I don't know, did I pivot? Did I stay the course? Uh, Providence stepped in. We got, we got something that fell out of the sky. Uh, since then, it's, it's never been looked back. So I think that those decisions, 
sometimes are completely out of your hands. You do the best you can, you get prepared for the worst, and then you have to hold tight and see what's gonna happen. Be that pivot or stay the course. I learned that from Dominic Clarusso, by the way. I, I think that, you know, for me, the more, more information you have, the better decisions you make. So rather than feeling like, well, of course, it's consistent with my style of leadership, rather than making all these decisions on your own and then deciding whether to do A or B, I think the more collaboration you have and the better decisions you make. And you, because you, uh, we, my, my companies is, the, the employees that we have all have different personalities and that's by design. I, we don't, I, don't, I haven't surrounded myself with yes people. I haven't surrounded myself with one type of person. People have different personalities and we've actually gone through the, these profiles that we have of how people think under stress and how they behave and how they approach problem solving. And so I think the more collaboration you have, the more input you have from a number of sources, the better decisions you have. So it, it may not even feel like a pivot uh, versus um, staying the course. It may feel like just the right decision. So that's my answer. Great. So we're just about 9 o'clock, and I want to make sure all of you are on schedule. So let me just do some um, wrap-up uh, steps. So first and foremost, please join me in thanking Stuart and Bob and also Sarah for um, a really interesting and, and um, engaging discussion this morning. Thank you.